What's up guys, Kudokun here, back at it again with the Big Wife Swords game. This month we'll be covering No Game No Life. No Game No Life is one of my favorite anime. I mean, it's not like my top personal favorites because the top three spots are reserved for Detective Conan, Roroni Kenshin, and Full Metal Alchemist, but I've always really enjoyed the show and I'll go back and rewatch it sometimes. It's never been that popular, but I've talked to some people that downright hate this show, and I'll admit it is kind of a fan y mess, but I think the show's really clever, I think the characters are really well written, and I think the story itself is pretty interesting. I think the main thing that turns people off from the show is that some people think there's this weird sexual tension between Sora and his little sister Shiro, but these people missed the point of the entire show, I think, because Sora and Shiro aren't like a couple. Sora and Shiro are one person. They're essentially one being that operates from two people. They're not in love with each other, guys. They're just really in sync. I digress, though. We're not here to talk about the show. We're here to talk about the cards. I'll just say, though, that if you've never seen the show for yourself, or if somebody told you not to watch the show because they didn't like it, I still recommend checking it out. It is, It does get pretty fan y but if that kind of thing doesn't bother you, then it's definitely worth at least checking out the first few episodes. So you guys know how this goes. We're gonna go over four cards from each color, and then if you guys enjoy the video and leave it a like, and this video hits, we'll say, 50 likes for right now, then I will do a second part if somebody reminds me. For now, let's just get straight to it. We'll start in yellow by looking at Sora, first move. Also, just to get it out of the way, I know that the No Game No Life community has some pretty intense waifu wars, but Sora is very clearly the hottest character on the show. You can disagree with me all you want to, but I'm right. Anyway, Sora first move will show us the main gimmick of the set No Game No Life, in that some cards come with an extra little mini game that you play in order to get some kind of effect. These effects can be hella powerful, but pulling them off is a pain in the neck and your opponent can always play around them. So first things first, when you play Sora first move, you can look at the top two cards of your deck, rearrange them, and then put them back. You then ask your opponent to pick a number between 0, 1, 2, or 3, and after they pick, you flip over the top card of your deck and discard it. Now, if your opponent guessed the same number as the level of the discarded card, you can draw cards equal to that number plus 1. So for example, if your opponent guessed the number 2, then you could flip over the top card of your deck and discard it. If that card is in fact level 2, then you can draw 2 cards plus 1 for a total of 3. Again, this is more of a gimmick than anything else, it's not something you can rely on. Uh, your opponent's probably never going to guess any of the higher numbers, like 3 or 2, because that would give you the most card draws. But then again, if you know that your opponent's not going to pick a high number like 3 or 2, they could pick a high number like 3 or 2 in order to trick you. But, if they know that you know that they know that picking that number would give you the highest draw, then maybe they'll pick a low number in order to stop you from getting a low number instead of a high... You know what, never mind, alright? It's, it's an interesting little mechanic, but it's not something you should ever count on in a competitive setting. That's all I'll say. Next up is Sora Sharing Memories. This card is pretty simple. Uh, there's an event card we'll be looking at later called Similar Beings, a little bit of a spoiler for those who haven't watched the entire video. And if it's in your memory, then this is a 9500 with 2 soul for 1 stock. I'm honestly just looking at this card because I think competitively this is probably one of the better cards in the set. A 1 cost 2 soul attacker at 9500 that comes into play off of a very, very easy to play event card that is actually a really good card. So. Really, I don't have anything else to say about this card. It's legitimately a good card. The level 3 Sora we'll be looking at is World Reborn. I know some people will want me to have looked at the other one, um, Amanity's Representative, but honestly, I like this card a lot more. And hey, if this video hits 50 likes, maybe we'll look at it next time. Who knows? So World Reborn. When it comes into play, you can look at the top X cards of your deck, where X are the number of game characters you have in play, and put one of those characters into your hand. And when this card attacks, you can discard a card from your hand and pay one stock to give this card plus 2,000 power, and if it reverses a character, you can deal one damage. I love this effect because it's not tied into a climax, so that technically makes this card splashable if you ever wanted to. 
Of course, with a set like this, with a gimmick like this, you can expect there to be some events that capitalize on it, and this is one of them. The aptly named Rock, Paper, Scissors is a game where you and your opponent play a game of Rock, Paper, Scissors, and you declare at the beginning of the game that you will for sure be throwing paper. The trick here is that you don't actually have to play paper, but if you do win with paper, you get a crazy reward. If you play paper and your opponent plays rock, then you get to draw four cards. If you play paper and your opponent plays paper, or if you win rock, paper, scissors using something else, then you get to draw two cards. But if you play scissors or rock, then this card goes into your clock as damage. The psychology behind this card is fascinating. Because as the turn player, you are encouraged to pick paper because there's no downsides. If you win, then you get to draw four cards. If you tie, you get to draw two cards, and if you lose, there's no penalty. Knowing this, your opponent's best bet is to pick scissors, because if you do go with paper, which is the safest bet, then they're going to win and you won't draw anything. But if they pick paper as well, then they can guarantee that you get to draw two cards while also eliminating the idea of you getting to draw four cards. And the chances of you picking scissors are a lot lower because if you pick scissors and they pick rock, then you'll have to take this card as damage. The hardest option for your opponent to pick is rock because if they lose to paper, then you get to draw four cards. If they tie with you picking rock, then you get to draw two cards. But if they happen to beat your scissors, then you take this card as damage, but that's only a 33% chance of happening. So knowing your opponent is in a position where picking rock would be their absolute worst option, they could honestly just pick rock knowing that you know that they can't pick rock because it's the worst option. Or they could stick with one of the safe options depending on how confident they are in their gambling ability, I suppose. And then again, knowing that your best option is to go into paper to get either the four cards or the two cards, or go into scissors to get the two cards or take the damage, but know that your opponent's going to pick paper, then your opponent could honestly use that against you to pick rock and guarantee that you take the damage. This entire thing is a bit of a mind freak, but this is what makes the idea within the game so interesting. Because these are the kinds of tricks and tactics that Sora and Shiro use to win their games in the anime. And again, it's not very competitive, but it is very interesting. On to blue, we're gonna look at Sora's cuter half, Shiro. In particular, Shiro, boring battle. This could possibly be my favorite card in the set. You guys know that I love my marker gimmick, and this could potentially be the best marker card that I've ever seen. Every time this card becomes reversed, you can discard one card from your hand and pay one stock to look at the top card of your deck, put it underneath this as a marker, and then rest it. Now the cool thing about this is normally when a marker card is reversed, it goes to the discard pile, and even if you encore it, it doesn't have its markers anymore. Due to the way this effect reads, your discard never hits the discard pile so it never loses its markers until you're ready for it to. And you also get to look at the card that you're putting underneath this as a marker so you know whether or not you're putting a climax under it. And for each card underneath this card, this gets a permanent plus 1500. So you could potentially just continuously run this into your opponent's stronger characters to keep building up the markers and make this an unstoppable beast. Eventually it'll be so strong that your opponent won't be able to step over it anymore, and the cool thing there is all the cards underneath this are not in your deck or your discard pile, so it's essentially like thinning out your deck using a third means. The main problem here of course is that you would have to find a way to keep up your hand advantage and your stock advantage, but I think those things could be managed rather easily, and I think this card could have a lot of promise. Move over, Kirito's Magic Markers! It's Shiro's Magic Markers now! Shiro Lovey Dovey is a level 2, 2 cost, 2 soul attacker, with an effect that gives you plus 1000 power for each of your game characters on attack, so potentially this card can be a 12,500 even before you factor in back row boosts. And it encores itself by discarding a character from your hand, so your opponent can't kill it, and during your turn, it's a 12,500. And it attacks for two soul. I don't really see the downside. We're gonna look at World Reborn Shiro to go along with her big brother, World Reborn Sora. If you have a card named Blank Sora and Shiro in your clock, this gets a minus one level in hand, which is a great, 
summoning condition because you can just clock Sora Shiro blank in order to play this card on level 2. When you play this card from your hand, you can draw one card and then put the top two cards of your stock into your hand, and then you take three cards from your hand and put them into stock. This is a wonderful ability, not just because it nets you plus one stock, but because you can look through your hands for the three worst cards and put them into stock so that your hand doesn't die. Something we haven't really gotten to look at much in blue is blue has a lot of interesting ways of controlling your stock. If we do another video like this, I'll show you guys what I mean, but honestly, the stock control in blue is top tier. And then finally, whenever your opponent uses an S ability, this gets plus 1500. Honestly, not that great, but I mean, just take what you can get, I suppose. The other two abilities are fine on their own. The blue event we'll look at is called Natural Born Genius. You have to have Shiro in play in order to play it, and you can look up to six cards from the top of your deck and put one of them in your stock and put the rest in the discard pile. The fact that you can put it on top or bottom is important for another card that we didn't look at today, but it is a pretty interesting ability if you combo it with the other cards that it combos with. The main reason I wanted to look at it is this is a great card not only for accelerating your stock, but also for thinning out your deck from a potentially awful, disastrous, unlucky set of circumstances that made you lose a bunch of your Climaxes. If your Climax control has been horrible, then this is a great way to just get rid of six cards from the top of your deck to get to your deck refresh faster, or if your Climaxes have not been showing up very much, you can just choose to look at, like, two cards to guarantee that you're not going to hit a Climax and accidentally discard it. And then you get one stock, the other one goes to the discard pile, and everything's fine. That kind of flexibility, plus the fact that it doesn't cost any stock to use, makes this a pretty nice little staple card if you happen to be running, like, a Shiro waifu deck. Unless you like Shiro or the bad guys, red is essentially the waifu color. To start us off, we'll look at what I think is probably the most influential card in red, and that's Steph, Inheritor of Beliefs. This card absolutely needs to be talked about alongside its event card counterpart, so you guys are going to get a two for one on this. When this card comes into play, you can look up to the top three cards of your deck, put one in your hand, and put the rest in the discard pile. Again, just like with Natural Born Genius, if you're not having very good luck with your climaxes, then you could just choose to look at three cards to get rid of as many cards as possible, or you could just choose to look at one card and guaranteed put one card in your hand. When this card attacks, if you have its Climax in play, you can deal X damage to your opponent based on how many of its events you have removed from the game. Uh, you can have up to four of them and play it once, obviously, so this could potentially deal four damage just by discarding two cards from your hands, and on top of that, it also gets plus 3,000 for the turn. The discarding two cards from your hands thing is a little rough. I really wish that weren't there, because if that weren't there, you could essentially just spam this ability and it'd be a really great win condition, but as it stands, discarding two cards from your hand means you're going to pull this off like maybe once or twice, but you're definitely not going to be able to spam it at all. Although if you were able to pull off all four of your Foolish Kings, then this could potentially be four damage over and over again, so who knows, you might be able to find a way to make it work. I just really wish that two card discard cost wasn't there. The event Steph is talking about is called The Man Called Foolish King. You can look at the top four cards of your deck and put one character into your hands, and as long as this is in your memory, all of your game characters get plus 500 power during your turn. On the surface, this is a shaky card, because you only get the power boost during your turn, making it a lot less useful, and the fact that you have to pay one stock to only look at the top four cards of your deck makes its searching potential not necessarily great. As most cards that let you search your deck for a specific character let you search your entire deck, not just the top four cards. But the trade-off is this is an amazing card to partner with your Shiro's. The marker Shiro never goes to your discard pile, so you don't have to worry about it not getting the plus 500 boost. And the Shiro that you play at level 2 can just discard a character card from your hand to stay alive. And this search is a character card, so no matter what you get, it can be fodder for Shiro. Getting a potential plus 2,000 boost from having these removed from the game and then just plowing your opponent with 4 damage in one attack is a really tempting idea, and I think that if I were going to make some kind of competitive uh, deck revolved around No Game No Life, it would essentially have to be a red-blue deck with maybe a splash of either yellow or green. 
Then again, that's just me. This could be the best set in the world for all I know, since I don't really follow the competitive scene, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Let's put Steph aside for a moment and talk about the best girl in No Game No Life, Jibril, who not only has an absolutely amazing level zero, but it's got probably some of my favorite artwork in the entire set. God dang, they nailed it with Jibril. Jibril's first ability is a real treat. I don't normally pay attention to level zeros with climax combos because they're normally not that great, but Jibril is a special case because when you have her climax in play, you can discard a card from your hand to give her a power equal to the character she's facing. So if you're facing a character with like 10,000 power, then this goes up to 12,000 and makes it strong enough to beat it. It's so cool. Now, of course, this isn't a completely unbeatable ability. There are ways around it. If your opponent plays a card that gives it uh, more power, like as an assist, or if the character has an ability that gives itself power um, after the battle's been initiated, then of course this effect doesn't do much. But the fact that it's a level zero that just lets you insta-kill anything else in the game without killing itself, mind you, it's not a suicider, uh, I just think that's really cool. <laughs> and I think it goes perfectly in the idea of having a red-blue deck. Also, I want to throw in that the climax that this combos with is in fact a door trigger, so it's not like you're not going to have four of them in your deck anyways. But Kudo-kun, I hear you ask, what happens when she dies? I am so glad you asked me that question. Let me tell you about Jabril's exit ability. You can put a card from your hand into your clock when this card goes from the stage to the waiting room to search your deck for any character and put it in your hands. Not the best search ability, but it is a pretty good one, and I think this card is probably going to be a staple for of in any deck that uses its climax. It's just too good. Next up, we'll of course look at another Jibril, uh, Absolute Cinnamon Bun Edition, Flugel in the Library. When this card is placed from hand to stage, it gets plus 50 soul for the turn. Now, <laughs> of course that means that this card absolutely cannot deal damage during it the first turn it's put in play. It's literally impossible. The only way it would be possible is if somehow your opponent ends up with 8 Climaxes in their hand and their stock, and uh, then the game is just an instant win. So I guess in a freak accident, this is actually an instant win card. But normally what happens is it hits play and it's a 7,000 that costs no stock. There's a pretty big debate between whether a 5,500 vanilla that costs nothing is better than a 7,000 vanilla that costs one. And this essentially puts an end to that debate because it comes into play for free at 7,000 and the downside is just that the first turn it comes into play it doesn't deal any damage. Of course, you can argue amongst yourselves whether or not uh, that is an acceptable ability for this to have, but I think personally, that this makes it a really easy card to splash into some decks that maybe don't have red as its main color. I probably wouldn't use too many of them myself, but I think having access to a free 7000 beater is really good, especially in a set that relies so heavily on stock to pull off its best tricks. Red also gives us our next game rule sudo card, or play a game card. Materialization Shiritori is going to take a little bit of time to explain, so please bear with me, I'm going to make this as smooth as possible. First of all, when you play this card, it goes to memory only if you don't already have one in memory. So if you've already played one for the turn, you can't play another one for the turn or else it won't have any effect. At the start of a climax phase, you can choose either yours or your opponent's climax phase for the record. Your opponent and you play a game, and the game is the player whose turn it currently is chooses a number between 0 and 3. If there is at least one character in play with a level equal to the number said, then all characters on the field with that level go to the discard pile. On the flip side, however, if there are no cards in play with that level, then each player gets to search their discard pile for a character of that level and put it into play. Since this happens during the climax phase, there's no chance for either player to adjust their field, so whatever you choose, it'll have to be based on what you and your opponent currently have and what you will want to accomplish for the turn, because you won't get a chance to fix anything. So let's try and go over the practical uses of this card. 
Obviously, it's going to be best if you are the one who is choosing, because if you wait for your opponent's turn, then they can find a way to uh, play around it, because they'll know it's going to be in your memory. But let's talk about how you would use it during your turn. Obviously, the best way is if your opponent's entire front row is going to be a single level, like if you're currently playing on level 1 and your opponent has a bunch of level 1s, you can declare level 1 to destroy all of their level 1 characters. But the trade-off here, of course, is that if you have any level 1 characters, they're also going to be defeated. Also, if it's distracting you that I picked level 1 because this is a level 2 card, then just pretend I said level 2, guys. Don't be nitpicky. Of course, that also means that we could choose not to say a level 2 or a level 1 or whatever level it currently is, and instead say a level that doesn't exist yet, like level 3. Since neither you or your opponent will have a level 3 in play, you can both search your discard pile for a level 3 and put it in play. What's great about this is you get to look through your opponent's discard pile beforehand, so if your opponent doesn't have a level 3, then it essentially just lets you play a level 3 and doesn't let your opponent do anything. You could of course also use this to get rid of level 3s if your opponent has a card that came into play a turn early. So, for example, if your opponent has a card that changed from level 2 to a level 3, you can get rid of that level 3 with no problem. If it goes to your opponent's turn and your opponent does this, then they've got some decisions to make. They can either try and wipe out your field, or if you play correctly and you have cards that are the same level as your opponent's and they don't want to get rid of their own cards, then they won't be able to, or they can choose to say a level that doesn't currently exist, giving you an extra character to play to maybe fill an open spot or fill out your back row. Just like with Rock, Paper, Scissors, I could sit here and talk about the mind games of this card for hours, but essentially just understand that it is an interesting card that will change the dynamic of the game if played correctly, and I would probably play it at at least two in any deck that uses red and blue heavily. Finally on our list is green. Green are mainly just the background characters, which honestly they're kind of boring. Green doesn't have that many good cards, but if you stick around you'll see a couple that might surprise you. First card up is a level 2 assist by level known as Feel, Important Being. Has the climax combo when you play Day of Promise Long Past and you pay one stock, you can choose one of your opponent's characters and move it into an empty slot on your opponent's stage. The main use being to take one of your opponent's back row characters and move it to the front row so you can kill it, but you could also take one of your opponent's front row characters and move it to the back row to attack an open slot for some free damage. This is what we in the Weiss Swords community call a dick move, bro. I feel like this card's conditions and costs are just so low that I have to mention it, because if you can play two of these in the back, then you just play the one climax, pay two stock, and move two of your opponent's characters, either freeing up two spots on their field, rearranging their field so that you're fighting the correct characters, or just moving their back row to the front row so you can kill them. There are also some neat tricks you can do with this and Shitty Toti, but we won't get into it right now. Overall, even though I don't think green is necessarily strong enough to build an entire deck around, I do think there are some great cards like this that you can splash that make it pretty playable. Most of the Izuna cards have to deal with Accelerate, and overall I like Accelerate as a concept, so I like this idea, and this is one of the cards that makes this idea really, really shine here in the set. Every time you Accelerate, you can look at the top card of your deck, and if it's a level 0, you can put it either on the top or bottom of your stock, which, once again, there are some cards that have to deal with the top or bottom card of your stock that we haven't looked at today. So, if you're playing correctly, this is just very easy stock manipulation. Uh, you can gain a stock every single time you use Accelerate, or even gain two stock if you have two of these in play, which is just really awesome. This card on its own also has Accelerate, so you can Accelerate to give this card plus 2,000 power and plus 1 soul for the turn. Now, the plus 2,000 power is pretty worthless, you can use it to step over a character, I guess, and get yourself to level 1 a little bit faster, but the plus 1 soul is important, because that means this card is a free 2 soul attacker whenever you need it to be. You can put it in an open spot, uh, accelerate it, get yourself the plus 2 soul attack off, and then just let it die, and on top of that you have the potential of gaining an extra stock using the card, so honestly it's just really good for that. 
I wouldn't necessarily say it's an important card or it's an absolute must-have staple, but I could see people leaning towards using this, and I myself might lean to using maybe two or three in most of my decks. We have one more Izuna in the form of Izuna, competitive splash player. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Uh, hates bathing. I don't know why I got hates bathing and competitive smash player mixed up. But if this card attacks with hated bath time in your climax area, you can pay one stock, and on your opponent's next turn, if they front attack this, this goes back to your hand. But wait, there's more! Then you can reveal the top card of your deck, and if that card happens to be a character, you can put that in your hand as well. So not only does this not die, and it's a free card so you don't have to pay for it again to play it again, but you also get to put another card in your hands, and essentially just draw a card, which is really cool. And again, this effect really isn't that offensive, it's just a really fine effect. Um, you would have to build around it for sure, like you would essentially have to be building a green deck around Accelerate and Izuna. I don't see splashing this because it requires that extra Climax combo, but honestly, if you really just wanted to run a green deck, I don't see why this wouldn't be a staple. The last card we'll be looking at today is Similar Beings. Look at the top two cards of your deck and put up to two game characters from it into your hand. So, essentially it's just draw two cards, because if you're playing a no game no life deck, chances are all of your characters are going to be game characters, and the only exception here is of course going to be if you happen to hit events or climaxes. For only one stock, that's really not that bad, and the fact that this card goes to memory afterwards makes it even better because it thins out your deck. Also, in case you forgot from the beginning of the video, this is the card that combos with Sora sharing memories. So, if you play this card at least once, then your Sora sharing memories are one cost, two soul attackers at 9500 power. I'd say that this card by itself makes green worth splashing into another deck. I'm seeing maybe like a yellow, green, red deck would probably be really interesting, because you would have the power from yellow, and you would have the amazing searchability of the green and red event cards that give you extra characters. And I think the green and red characters could probably carry you into level 2, where Shiro would just flat out win the game for you, especially if you're using this alongside Foolish King. Of course, if you're running this and Foolish King in the same deck, it might be a little bit difficult to hit those two character cards and really get the most out of this card, or uh, even run Rock, Paper, Scissors, because that would be even more events, but I guess balancing that out is something we'll have to talk about another time. So what do I think of the set? I'm not disappointed. The set does seem like it's a lot of fun to play with, and I think the idea of the play a game cards adds a new depth to the game that could potentially be a really fun to play around with. Though, I will stand by what I said before in that I don't think this is really a very competitive set. It does have some competitive stuff within it. I could definitely see some characters getting out of hand, especially that Shiro Marker card, which is still amazing, by the way. But I don't really see this deck necessarily being consistent enough to always be able to perform well. Now, that being said, of course, my favorite set of all time is still the Disgaea set, which is really gimmicky and very combo-oriented, so I can't really say that uh, I'm against the idea of the deck altogether. I look forward to building a couple of decks and showing them to you soon. If I did have any main complaints about the deck, I feel like Sora and Shiro themselves don't work together that well. I, you could run them together, and I do see a lot of interesting um, gameplay elements between a couple of their cards, but there just aren't that many cards that really combo together. Like, I think there are more combos between Sayaka and Kyoko than there are Sora and Shiro, and one of their elements from the show is that they can't be separated from each other or they lose their minds. Which is depicted in a set of level 0 cards, but, like, I can't really see building a full deck that's just Sora and Shiro. I feel like you would absolutely need to splash red and green in the deck to make it work. But that's a nitpick, of course. Like I said before, I don't mind that this set isn't necessarily competitive. I think that there's a lot of really fun combos, and I think the play game elements make this fun enough that I will enjoy playing with the set for some time to come. You know, something I've been thinking about recently is I never seem to give any love to the special promo cards that come out with these sets. 
which is a shame because some of them have really nice artwork, especially if you're into fan service like I am. And seeing as how this is a, such a fan service heavy show, I figured it would be fun to maybe go over these special promo cards in a new segment I'd like to call the Super Promo Showcase. First up, of course, we've got Jabril, absolutely loving the back curve they've got there. Very sexy, but also extremely tasteful. Feel laying on her side. The eye contact is stunning. And also, if you notice with the breast shape, you can see that they actually made it conform to the fact that she's lying down and turned over on her side. Absolutely amazing detail, and I love how the card cuts off right there where you would expect the nipple to be. Steph, of course, with that adorable, uncomfortable look on her face. Bushy Road is getting really brave with the placement of the arms there, because honestly, this is essentially the kind of thing that I don't think could even be shown on American television. Altogether, though, the sitting position, the camera angles, and the placement of the arms make for an absolutely stunning pose. Now we move on to sh Oh. Oh! Ahem. <coughs> Ahem. <coughs> You know, on second thought, let's never, ever, ever do that segment again, ever, 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 and hope to God that my YouTube channel is still here when you guys get back. If it is, there should be more content on the way. Please comment down below what your favorite card in the review was, and I hope to see you guys soon.